Welcome to STEPS, a staff training program run by the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University. I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to this Staff Development STEP program. This is one moment, one training bit that when you combine with four other bits becomes an elective. So I hope you enjoy the session today and has a, a very interesting and an odd origin. It's titled SOC. <laughs> which stands for Significant Original Contribution to Knowledge. And I presented a student training vlog on SOC because it clearly is a moment in international higher education and a moment in higher degrees as well. And so I wanted to at least make sure the students were aware of the movement from the original contribution to knowledge to the significant original contribution to knowledge. And so I sent that out and about for the students. And one of my great colleagues, the wonderful Professor Ross McKinnon, on Twitter, bless him, he's a wonderful human being, and he's also our one of our deans of research at Flinders University. And his comment on Twitter was, supervisors have absolutely no idea about this. <laughs> <laughs> Ross, you're a legend. And so what I thought I would do is just rewrite some of this material for supervisors so that we do know what's going on. It is a remarkable change. It is new. It's innovative. I only started to hear about this about 18 months ago myself. So let's have a think about SOC, the Significant Original Contribution to Knowledge, and get into it. And as I think we all know, the, the definition of a Doctor of Philosophy that makes it distinct from a Master's by Research is an original contribution to knowledge. So a doctorate offers originality within a knowledge system, whereas a master's synthesizes knowledge. So originality really is the crucial defining characteristic of a PhD. But the SOC is a fascinating way of crystallizing the doctoral project. Significant, original, contribution to knowledge. And by the way, I do disagree, I think, with SOC, and you'll hear about it in this training podcast today. But I think it is interesting. I think it's a fascinating way to codify doctoral education, but it does have some problems. So in this little presentation I'm going to do for you today, this quick five minutes, I'm going to take a really simple structure. I'm going to take each of the four words in the acronym, significant, original, contribution and knowledge and render them resonant for the work we do as supervisors and indeed our thinking about the doctoral program more generally. But of course, just to be contrary, <laughs> and there's actually a reason for it too, I'm not going to do the letters in order. So I'm not going to do SOC. In fact, I'm going to invert them and do COS. K-C-O-S. Just not as catchy, is it? So the reason I'm doing that is I'm starting with the least controversial term and moving to the most controversial term. So let's start with our least controversial term, and that's obviously knowledge. Knowledge is the theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. It can be obtained formally or informally. And the term implies understanding of something, so facts or ideas or skills. More specifically, in philosophy, of course, the study of knowledge is epistemology. Knowledge is not simply true, but following on from Plato, knowledge is justified true belief. I love that. So for Plato, there really was a criteria for knowledge, justified, true, believed. Just because we believe it doesn't mean it's true or it's justified. And that's indeed what makes knowledge, knowledge. And while that is a bland description, I think the important part of that phrase for us is the justified element. So knowledge is not a vibe. It's not a feeling or an assumption. It's a justified belief. And it is also believed, and that means an individual can't simply invent knowledge. Knowledge is shared, and most importantly, it is believed by others. So knowledge has an audience. Therefore, knowledge must be disseminated, assessed, evaluated, and yes, believed. Knowledge is crucial, I think, to a scholarly life, but also, really, it's what make, makes philosophy philosophy, and that's that theory of knowledge that undergirds it. 
Our next word in the SOC acronym is the C word. In this case, the C word is contribution. How a PhD makes a contribution to knowledge. Contribution is the role or part played by a person or an object that enables the advancement of something. That something could be the advancement of knowledge, but contribution is also linked with importance. So have you as a scholar intervened in your field? Have our students intervened in their field? And it might have, for example, possible policy implications or how practices have changed in a particular field or laboratory or clinic. A contribution can recontextualise a theory, a model or a technique. It can expand an already existing model. It can combine two or more ideas to create something new. Often that's interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity. Impact is also, I think, a way into this discussion, but it is obviously a very ambiguous word at the moment. But if we start to think about the impact of our research, the impact of our students' research, then that will allow us to start to articulate a contribution to knowledge. Okay, there's the C word. Let's do the O word, originality. A PhD must present, demonstrate and confirm how the research is original. You know, I ensure that my students write a sentence in their thesis and I I get them to put that sentence in the abstract, in the introduction, in the conclusion at least. And that sentence is, my original contribution to knowledge is. And they finish it with whatever their original contribution to knowledge is. And that sentence is important because it means the examiner can see what their original contribution to knowledge is. So often we see with problematic examination reports, the examiners say, I'm sorry, I can't find the originality here. So by presenting it in a sentence, in the abstract, introduction and conclusion, they can find it. So the best doctoral research presents originality in a succinct focus and critical way. So originality in a doctorate is not demonstrated in a woolly or generalised fashion. We really have to be able to pinpoint with clarity the original contribution to knowledge. So originality is confirmed through having a strong and expansive grasp of the literature, verified through a literature review or an integrated literature review or a systematic review, and then research methods transparently presented that creates something new. That scaffolds you from existing knowledge to originality, and we've got to prove that for our students and indeed for the examiners. The literature review and the research methods confirm the students' accountability, transparency and repeatability of their research. The important part of this originality discussion is that the PhD must demonstrate originality. It's not simply a matter of outlining the originality. It has to be demonstrated how the student reached originality and how the research created something meaningful. And again, that's a significant word here too, meaningful. So originality is more than something that is novel or unique. Originality manifests in a doctorate through presenting new information for the first time or carrying out original research, generating, executing, if you will, an original technique, observation or result. Big hi to all our nano crew out there, nanoscience, nanotech. Very often it is about that original technique or observation or result. You've got an original idea or method or interpretation. The originality could emerge in the mode of testing someone else's ideas. You could be doing empirical work that hasn't been done before. Again, that's very common in the social sciences. You might be applying an old technique to a new area. Love those theses. Fantastic. You might also be finding new evidence that transforms our understanding of an old issue. We see that quite often in the humanities, I think, particularly, say, in history. So the key challenge here is a PhD must not simply claim originality, it must demonstrate it in a substantiated way. And there's many ways that we can do this as supervisors to help our students demonstrate it, but framing the students' work within the context of existing evidence, literature and methods is really the most effective and efficient way. So in that way we can present with clarity an original contribution to knowledge. I also love David Lodge's statement about originality. I think it came way off a couple of decades ago now. Might even be a couple of decades and a half, I think. And he stated about originality, quote, deviating from the conventional, the habituated ways 
of representing reality. End of quote. Fantastic. So here we go with the final initial and word, the S word, and this is the one that worries me. So this is significant. So this is significant in the original contribution to knowledge. So while, as we've shown, there are objective and verifiable strategies to demonstrate originality, a contribution and knowledge, significance is in the eye of the beholder. Students worry quite rightly, I think, and obviously supervisors too worry as well about examiners being arbitrary in their judgments, picking out random or bizarre errors or flaws. We've all seen it. And obviously the power held by examiners in a PhD is enormous. A student spends three years and the value of those three years is held in the hands of two examiners. And that's why we have policies and procedures and checklists, because we just try and frame and create normative parameters for examiners. But of course, examiners can go a bit rogue. We have all seen it. And policies obviously try and control that rogue behaviour. But we've got to believe in examiners. We've got to believe in the ethics and integrity of our colleagues. I certainly do. And because of the occasional rogue one, it doesn't mean we don't believe in examination. We must. So original contribution to knowledge means we as examiners are looking for a presentation of the literature and then a demonstration about how the research methods have taken knowledge somewhere else to originality. So it's really not hard. But the word significant does worry me. And don't get me wrong, it is fantastic if a thesis makes a significant contribution. But significance is difficult to prove. <laughs> and it's very difficult to verify. So as I was moving through the international literature to try and think about what exists out there to help students and supervisors think about significance, look, I found four clear strategies that are being used around the world to move us from simply thinking about originality to significant original contribution to knowledge. So here are the four questions or tropes or ideas that are being used around the world at the moment. So, getting students to consider the importance of their research questions. So, explain why the research was worth doing, right? That's the first strategy to think about significance. Secondly, the significance of the findings. So, why should the examiner care? Why do the students' findings actually matter? Three, explain how your research has transformed theory, that significance. And the fourth variable, and this is a quite an interesting one, I think, explain the generalizability or the lack of generalizability in the student's research. And both, of course, can be a sign of significance. So if we can break significance down a little bit, we can start to recognize that a student has made a contribution to research that is worth making. Here we go. So the research has value. Mm -hmm. And just to add a, a further worry to the word significant, it can also capture the importance or the interest of research, our students' research, by stakeholders. There's that word. So economic, social or cultural significance. So significance can link with impact and therefore for a lot of topics they can be dismissed pretty easily as unimportant because they're not contributing to the policy flavour of the day. See my worry? So the more challenging definitions of significance, and we start to get into really shaky ground here, is when examiners have in their mind definitive parameters for the scope and the scale of research. So in their minds, they have a PhD must deploy a particular scope and scale of a data set or reading. Significance is never about size, because as we all know, a very small discovery can be incredibly significance, significant. But it is about importance. And my worry is that importance can be subjective. In fact, it is subjective. Let's call a spade a shovel. So all the other letters in SOC, originality, contribution, knowledge, can be demonstrated, confirmed, verified, tethered to evidence. Cool. Significance is much more difficult to prove. It's much more in the gift and the subjectivity of the examiner. Significance, like importance, is defined by and from a particular perspective. All of us, all of us as scholars, consider particular topics important and particular topics as significant and others less so. Absolutely. 
and that determination is completely arbitrary, subjective and sometimes political. All examiners, like all researchers, all of us, have biases. We have favoured tropes and techniques and technology and methods and theories, and the claim, therefore, for significance can be channelled in that direction. So, therefore, it is useful for us as supervisors to help and guide our students and be aware of the changing language and landscape of doctoral education. So, Ross, I'm really grateful for you probing me to say, let's get our supervisors ready for this. So we are seeing a movement from an original contribution to knowledge to a SOC, to a significant original contribution to knowledge. So how would I handle this as a supervisor? And obviously I've got students that are just starting now in this new environment. How would I handle it with my own supervision? What I've been recommending to my students is right at the start of their PhD program, they open up a Word document that's called the significance file. And in the significance file, I get them to log anything that they think is actually really important or significant on the way through. So it could be an innovation in a method that suddenly it's happened and, oh, that's significant. Just write that paragraph up for me and put it in the significance file. You might have found a really rare source that you were able to locate and the student was able to really claim some significance on their archival research. Or, for example... Significance can emerge through a key connection and resonance with the policy of the day. So actually writing that prose up is important. So on the way through, just start to gather up some prose so that students have those special paragraphs that make the case for significance. So I hope this very short session has been helpful. Ross, thank you for the suggestion. You remain an absolute inspiration, sir. It is a pleasure to work with you. So, yes, we're in sock times. Thank you for listening to this STEPS training program on behalf of the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University.